scripture reading. Let's stand as we do. Read it. Read the word of God this morning. Acts chapter 20 and verses 17 to 24. <clears throat> Speaking on the subject this morning, finishing my course with joy. Finishing my course with joy. Acts 20, 17 says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Let's read it together. Let's start beginning now. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, saving that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Our Father, we ask now you bless the reading of your word, and we pray that you would now bless the preaching of it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Finishing my course with joy. It's interesting, Paul didn't just say finishing my course, but he said finishing my course with joy. You know, there's, there's a difference in just finishing something and then not only finishing something, I need another battery, okay? All right? But being happy with what you finished. You ever finish something and you didn't like the result? Uh, those of you who are painters, I'm not an, art, I'm not an artist, okay? My wife is artistic. Uh, my wife does uh, cakes. I, can t I can't, can't tell you how many times that she has pretty much almost got the cake done and then she's gone back over it with buttercream and redone it because she didn't like how it came in the finished product. Same with an artist. Uh, same with anything that we do. We want to, in, we want to have joy in finishing. And Paul is saying, I'm, I'm happy, I'm glad with how it all turned out. He's at the end of his life, and he's saying, I have no regrets. I don't have anything that's, that, that's concerning me. Now, obviously, he knows that as, a, as a man of God, even as a man of God, but as a human being, that he, he didn't do everything like he wanted to. But he says, I have joy. At this point in my life, I have joy. And so it's important for us not just to finish. We talk a lot about finishing. We talk a lot about duty. We, and, you know, my dad and I, when we were in Arizona recently, when we went down to uh, the conference in Phoenix, we, we talked about this. And we talked about <clears throat> how so often we, we preach duty and we suck the life out of the Christian life. And we make it... We make it like it's a job. We make it like it's... And you know what? I, I, I get duty. If, if you don't show up to work, you just decide, well, you know what? I, I just don't feel like going to work. Well, you're probably not going to have a job for very long. Maybe not even that day. Okay? So there's a, there's a, a, a balance of duty, but there also should be some feeling in it. I, I love what I'm doing. I hope you love what you're doing. And that you enjoy not only your job, but you enjoy your life. There's nothing like serving Jesus. And you can serve Him, whether you're full-time ministry, or what, you're in the business world, whatever that you're doing. You can have, there's joy in serving the Lord. 
And Paul talks about this joy. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're all looking one day to hear the words, well done. Do you, you think that that would bring you joy from hearing from God, well done? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the, what does he say? Joy of the Lord. So, <clears throat> to be able to have that is either what we're all looking for. And Paul does a good job here in, in pointing out how to have joy at the finish, and he points out some things that we must see from God's perspective. Number one, there's, we must see joy in serving. We must see joy in serving. I'll be honest with you, in, in ministry i found that there is a mentality with some believers that certain things are above them. That it's just, that's just too demeaning. I don't have to do that. Or I'm not going to do that. They've lost their joy. Look at your Savior. There was nothing that he was not willing to do. Nothing. I, and I, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about serving. He said, <clears throat> I didn't come to be ministered unto. Now this is God. God in human flesh talking. He says, I didn't come to be ministered to, but I came to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. And did he not do that when he was on the earth? He was the epitome of service. One of the most well-known stories that we read about him was when he girded himself with a towel and he went one by one and he washed the disciples' feet. And Peter said, I'm not, you know, not doing that to me. That's, that's beneath you, Jesus. You don't need to do this. And Jesus said, look, if, it, if, if you don't let me do this, you have no part of me. What he was saying is not that he was going to lose his salvation. He was saying, you don't, you don't understand and nor will you be effective in ministry. I'm showing you an example of what I want you to do when I leave here. How you serve me. And here Paul points out the following things in relation to the joy of service. Number one is serving with a humility of mind. Turn, if you will, uh, back to our text and look at what he says. In verse <clears throat> number 19. He says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Jesus said, <clears throat> if we are going to be exalted, we must first be abased. The way up in God's arena is down. And again, to show you an example of Jesus' example of humility, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Nobody could illustrate humility more than Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Reads this way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God... Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, if you're, now just, I'm going to just say this. If your Bible doesn't have that, that he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, get another Bible. It didn't say that he did not think himself to be, that he was equal with God. That is not what the Bible says. Now, there's a major translation that tra translates that differently. What it means is Jesus knew he was God. He knew he was equal with God. But now I want you to look at what it says in the next verse. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be, be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He did not have to do that. He could have said, this is beneath me. By the way, if you think for one minute when he was in the garden and he was saying, Father, not my will, but thine be done, please take this cup from me. He was asking to eliminate the cross. Get, you, you need to get that out of your head. 
The Bible says he set his face like a flint towards our redemption. What he was, he was not saying at that point in the, in, in the garden, I don't want to do this. At any time, he told, the, he told Pilate, he says, you have no power over me. I could call 12 legions of angels right now, and they could come and get me and take me out of here. That was not his purpose. That was not his plan. He set himself to do what he did. And he made himself of no reputation. And it started when he was born. He was born in Bethlehem, a nothing town. He was raised in Nazareth, another nothing town. Philip, the disciple, prior to him becoming a disciple, or Nathaniel rather, Philip came to him and said, We found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? For real, Philip, you really think the Messiah came from Nazareth? This Jesus, the carpenter's son? He was not embraced as the Son of God. In fact, if you read several chapters later into the New Testament, you find that the people of Nazareth took him over to a hill and were going to cast him off the hill because of who he claimed to be. He made himself of no reputation. He, wasn't a blue, he, he was a blue blood, but he didn't act like a blue blood. He put himself under the hand of the Father. And now look what it says. Not only did he make himself of no reputation, the Bible says, and took upon him the form of a what? There it is. He saw the joy of serving. And we need to see the joy of serving again. In verse 7, he says, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The most painful and the most shameful death a man could die. And that's Jesus. So let me say this, there's nothing beneath us in relation to serving the Lord. Yes, Lord, whatever you decide, whatever you want, Lord. You see that with all the great Christians. Paul, when he was, when he was struck down on the Damascus Road, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, it is, I'm Jesus, who you whom you're persecuting. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And what was his next question? What would thou have me to do? I'm yours. Whatever. Joy in serving. The next thing. Paul said we need to see joy in suffering. Go back to our text. And look at verse 19 again. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Look at verse 23. Save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Let me ask you this question. I mean, and I'll even ask myself this question. If God told you for the rest of your life on earth, the rest of your ministry, it's going to be filled with tears and it's going to be filled with suffering. How many of us would keep serving Him? How many of us would be willing to follow through and suffer for His namesake? Jesus never flinched with the suffering. The Bible says, in being in an agony, he was in an agony in the garden. He sweat as it were great drops of blood. 
And then on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he did it because he knew what it would do. Suffering. Let's look at that first one, tears. Relates to sorrow. Go, if you will, to Psalm 30 in verse 5. This is a wonderful verse of Scripture assuring us that as we serve the Lord, that we can still see joy in suffering. God didn't promise us a rose garden. He didn't promise us everything was going to be honky-dory. Verse 5, For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but hallelujah, joy cometh in the morning. There's joy in suffering. Go, if you will, to Psalm 126, verse 5. Psalm 126 and verse 5. Psalm 126 in verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with what? Rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Joy in suffering. It's not the easiest thing. 